Welcome to the North Coast Journal Preview, where we take a look at the stories being covered in the current edition of the North Coast Journal. I'm your host, Dave Frank, and I'm joined this week by Thad Greenson, news editor, and Jennifer Famico Cahill, arts and features editor at the North Coast Journal. Welcome, guys. Hey. Hey, Dave. How you doing? Pretty good. Good to see you. Um, hopefully, you guys are enjoying some sunshine in the midst of all the rain. It's a nice yeah, little so respite, fun. but I've been loving the rain. It's um, nice. Yeah. Yeah, we're due. Good rainfall at night. And it's cold rain, which means lots of snow. Mm -hmm. I feel like I should let you know before anybody wonders, this is not my dark lair. I am actually at the Access Humboldt Studio, which is in uh, in the College of the Redwoods campus now, over in the old administration building, if you ever need to find it. And like me, you're walking all over to like Egypt and back looking for it. But... It's here and it's very cool. So, all right. Well, why don't we um, get moving? And Thad, why don't you tell us about uh, what's on the cover of this week's North Coast Journal? Yeah, this week we have a story looking back on, uh, well, knock on wood, looking back on the state's uh, fire season this year. Um, and so it is a Calmatters rundown, kind of looking at the fire season by the numbers. Um, and, um, you know, I think for certainly those of us in the eastern Humboldt County um, who lived through weeks, seemingly weeks on end of dealing with these Six Rivers Lightning Complex fires, um, it might not seem like it, but uh, the state had a, you know, mild, uh, comparatively mild fire season um, compared to recent years. Um, and so Cal Matters just kind of does not a really good rundown of the data and kind of looking at why that is. And um, the short answer is a lot of luck. Um, we got some really timely rain um, that extinguished a couple a couple fires in the state that could have grown much larger. <clears throat> and um, we also just had some good fortune of having the fires a bit spaced out. Um, so we didn't have several major fires burning all at once. And so, you know, for us up here, um, and especially with the Six Rivers Lightning Complex, that was um, that was a huge help because it allowed um, not just state, but state and federal resources to really focus on getting that Six Rivers Lightning Complex fire under control, um, as opposed to having resources siphoned off to other parts of the states that were facing big fires. Um, so it's just kind of a, a, a good rundown now that we're in December, although um, it uh, you know includes a quote from Gavin Newsom saying, you know, we're not out of the woods yet and we all need to be diligent because fire season is kind of a year round thing in California now. Yeah, thank you for covering that Cal Matters article and I'm sure there'll be more to follow, I guess, if it's year round and we're going to be paying attention to this um, perpetually, unfortunately. It's a, it's a, you know, between climate change, drought, fires, um, it's just, it's it's an all- uh, all year long kind of topic. So thank you definitely for, for uh, highlighting that Cal Matters article this week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what else you got going on on the news beat this week, Todd? Yeah, so this week we also, we have a story that uh, that our digital editor Kimberly, Kimberly Weir um, uh, localized for us. Um, it's a story from Indian Country Today about a collection um, of hair samples found in Harvard uh, University's Peabody Museum. Um, and essentially these were hundreds of hair samples taken from native children as they were, um, as they were taken into Indian boarding schools, um, across the country, including, um, the two schools nearby, um, that, uh, local native children were, were taken into. Um, and so Harvard has had these, these samples for, um, you know, for decades and decades and, uh, it's a little bit unclear why just now is um, is kind of addressing them, is notifying tribes, and is in the process of, of returning these samples to um, to tribes and to family members of um, well, in some cases the the actual um, people who had been in the boarding schools, and in other cases their descendants. Um, so as I as I say often, there's so much uh, granular, nuanced detail in the article, and I highly recommend folks check it out. But but kind of big picture for people that don't know, um, there's an element in the story that um, references the um, Na Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and so part of this issue is you know Harvard's 
role responsibility, but another part of it is like the legacy of uh, in the United States and Canada um, of uh, this, these types of practices that made this even possible. Um, and then, and then finally, this act itself kind of is the the I guess the reference point of how actors are supposed to behave in actions like repatriation of hair samples. But can you kind of give us your a uh, little bit of context, your, your take on the context for how this ha ha will impact our community? Yeah, well, that's a that's a big question. Yeah, um, sorry. You know, I mean, I, as to the the repatriation act, I, I would say that um, you know, there's some in the story, there's some some you know dispute or controversy around exactly how to what degree that act um, is applicable to these samples and whether um, hair samples um, can be considered you know human remains and um, and and subject to the act. Um, but you know, I think for the I think the the big takeaway, I think, for readers on, on here on the North Coast is just that the legacy of these boarding schools is is very much alive in here today, you know, and for, um, you know, for Native communities that um, that trauma is is present and, and ever reverberating um, of the impacts of um, having people taken from their families, um, you know, systemat systemic um, attempts to strip them of their culture. Um, their language, their culture, um, and the trauma associated with that is, you know, is, is ever present, and it's not something that is in the distant past at all. And, um, you know, I think Canada is, is ahead of the United States in kind of addressing that with a full kind of truth and reconciliation process um, of really researching what happened in these boarding schools, um, thorough documentation of who was there, um, and um, kind of making some amends for, um, you know, for crimes of the past. And, you know, we don't really don't have that in the United States. And so one of the things that some of the folks in the article are talking about is just a lack of kind of a, a, um, a mental health crisis response. Um, um, for um, for native communities when things like this come up and so um, you know you have um, families being contacted that um, a, a loved one's hair sample were found that you know brings a lot of trauma forward and um, and they don't these families don't really have a place to turn um, and uh, you know our government has not respond you know has not funded a kind of a mental health response to um, to deal with some of these um, reverberating issues that you know that continue to um, um, you know, especially crop up when when discoveries like this happen. Um, and like I said, there's so much more in there. But one of the um, details in the article is information box. Uh, it says trauma care. So there are resources available. Um, and, and so they do point to there is an organization that's trying to fight the good fight here. Yes, there's a there's a nonprofit that has started, um, but I, th I think the point in the story is just that, that we need to put more funding behind uh, behind these efforts. Um, right. But you know, I think um, the the story I think is really impactful in that you know it um, it includes a, a lot of um, different perspectives, but one of them is you know is from uh, Ted Hernandez, chair of the Weat Tribe and their cultural preservation officer. Um, who just talks about the, his very personal response to hearing that um, that we ought children's hair samples were were held in this collection and and um, you know that it just um, you know he wonders if it was his grandmother or her siblings um, and um, it just you know felt like a kind of a gut punch to him hearing that uh, you know caused this great sadness just to hear that these samples are out there um, and so I think it just um, you know, I think it's for um, us on the North Coast, I think it's a, just a really good reminder that um, this legacy is, is not very far behind us. It is, it is, in fact, still playing out. And just real briefly before we pivot to the uh, next topic with you, um, there, for folks who don't know about why, for example, hair samples would be taken, um, there's an element when you're saying the legacy of, you know, colonialism. Um, can, can you speak briefly to to that, uh, you know, heinous history that we all? It's part of all of our uh, national history. Yeah. So I, you know, the hair hair samples were, you know, ostensibly taken. I, well, first, um, children's hair was cut when they were um, admitted into the boarding schools, ostensibly to, um, you know, uh, cut down on the, the likelihood of, of transmitting lice within the boarding school, and as kind of a health measure. Um, you know, there's certainly people who believe that this was very much a, a part of stripping culture as well um, and indoctrination. Um, 
but um, the you know the samples were ta were kept um, so that a scientist could ostensibly study different hair types um, across different um, you know racial and ethnic um, groups and um, you know really it's it's described in the article as you know as a, a scientific racism and of trying to use use science to um, somehow buttress or support racist ideas um, and um, that's you know that's very much the the purpose of these these samples um, you know and for you know as as uh, chair Hernandez I think very you know clearly describes that you know for native communities also that the fact that it was their hair is um, takes on a, you know a special um, Results in a special trauma, and that um, hair cutting was not something they they typically did on a normal basis. That um, you know their hair was considered very precious to them, and um, there was only very limited um, circumstances in which they cut their hair, often as a, a part of a mourning process. So, it's like a cherished cultural practice was was sort of sacrificed in the name of conformity, but right. then uh, beyond that, it was also utilized for eugenic purposes, exactly. for racial hierarchy and superiority. Mm -hmm. And and you know, independent of that, some of the practices in this article talk about how uh, there were things that occurred, you know, from the 20s right up to the 70s. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, some people think, oh, this is ancient history, but it's it's not the case. Um, so I want to thank you so much. I'm just moving us along because I know we have a very important editorial to discuss, mm -hmm. but we really appreciate you guys highlighting this and uh, and explaining the, its importance to the entirety of our uh, North Coast community. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm going to, I think, I'm not sure we didn't talk about this, whether Jen or Thad will address this issue, but you guys have an editorial that we should speak to today. Do you want to uh, get that started? Yeah, I think I think we should absolutely both address it since we okay. both wrote it. Um, okay. But yeah, so this week we, we wrote an editorial. Um, I think uh, viewers, readers, listeners will recall um, that we recently ran a cover story about uh, Brias Healthcare and its uh, skilled nursing properties in Humboldt County and the, the owner, um, Shlomo Regnus's practice of using related party transactions. So essentially um, doing business between the nursing home he owns and other companies he owns um, in order to kind of bilk profits from Medicare and Medi-Cal. And um, we've been reporting on on this practice for, I think, more than six years now um, in different iterations, but essentially about how he is um, extracting you know, huge profits from these skilled nursing facilities while they are understaffed, underfunded, and patients are suffering. And so after that cover story, um, we ran a cartoon um, by our regular cartoonist, Terry Torgerson, that depicted um, Shlomo Rechnitz um, and saying kind of, what did I do? And then there's a list of offenses on the side of understaffing his facilities and the impacts that that has on um, on the residents there. And um, after running that cartoon, we were contacted by a number of readers who felt that it was anti-Semitic um, and that we should not have run it. And it was playing on anti-Semitic tropes and adding to what is really this kind of groundswell going on right now of um, anti-Semitic uh, sentiments that are being kind of increasingly expressed publicly in, in a really alarming way. Um, and so, you know, whenever we get feedback like that, we take it very, very seriously. And, and Jen and I and the rest of the newsroom had some long conversations about kind of why we felt this um, this cartoon wasn't anti-Semitic, why we felt it was appropriate to run initially, but then also kind of reflecting on the, the very real harm that, that running the cartoon caused to some people, um, whether or not that was, you know, um, whether we not that was our intent or we foresaw that coming, the, the fact is that it did cause some harm and we wanted to address that, um, explain our decision and apologize um, for having run it. I think too that it was an opportunity for us to be um, really transparent about how we make decisions about what to run. Um, and that even if we, you know, and, and we really shared about our process and talking about how the reason that we ran the image um, was because Rechnitz is not caricatured here. He's not made to be a stand-in for Jewish people. The list of his offenses is, is specific to him and to the industry in which he's done all this stuff. Um, none of it is about the character of, you know, an imagined monolith of Jewish people. Um, there are, one of our readers sent us a very, you know, helpfully and thoughtfully, um, some old uh, sort of vintage racism propaganda cartoons and things. And 
indeed, the clothing is similar because the clothing has not necessarily changed in a lot of years for Orthodox Jewish conforming clothing. Um, however, in those images, you know, the stand in for all Jewish men is doing sort of heinous things or seem to be somehow victimizing, you know, innocent Aryan people. And obviously the message that was that those cartoons were intended to give is that here's this terrible presence that, you know, now we're justified to mistreat and even kill. And we looked at what we ran and we did not see that same intention. We certainly, that is not Terry Torgerson's intention and we've had discussion with him on that. Um, but it also was, um, you know, it was not an exaggeration. It was not a blowing up. It was a very straightforward rendering of this man and the things that he's done. Because what we're trying to get across or what Terry was trying to get across is that hiding behind all these companies is this one individual, this one man whose face is rendered in the cartoon. However, you know, as Thad said, we also had to recognize the initial impact of that image and the zillions of times that the use of, you know, Orthodox Jewish dress in a political cartoon has been harmful and has been nasty and an attack. Um, that it's been represented as a kind of a costume of villainy. And at this point, regardless of whether or not there is intent, the initial recognition of, oh, this reminds me of those cartoons is still there. And it's a real painful feeling. And it's a painful feeling to see in your own community, right? So we did want to be able to say, this is our system. This is how we made the choices. This is why we do not think it has any kind of anti-Semitic intent. However, we also have to recognize, you know, that harm was done, that we, you know, we ran something that people felt shocked and, and hurt by. Um, it's not enough for us to just say, oh, well, we didn't mean that. So, you know, or to, I don't know, what do you do? You, what do you do now? You like riff on cancel culture or something. Um, but we have to address and have the conversation. Um, I think it's more productive to have the conversation rather than just to apologize and duck. Mm -hmm. I'd say with that in mind, thank you both for explaining um, in the editorial more thoroughly, but then today verbally. Um, it's, you know, it, 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 there's a clarity here about, about the process and, and your reaction to, to the observations of fellow community members. So thank you for being so, you know, so transparent, like you said. Absolutely, I think it's it's crucial, and I I just really want to again thank the um you know I thank them individually um or directly, but thank the readers who came forward to to express their concern with us um, and their reaction um because uh, we would uh, you know when when people do have such strong reactions to something that we publish um we want to know about it so we can address it and and um, and deal with the situation so and I'll just add I end on a positive because it seems very somber um. On a positive, you are covering an extremely important issue to to all of our community, not just seniors, not just people who's who are residents, um, and it and it's a systemic uh, issue that we really that you know the 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 the, the, the what's it the fourth estate you know really does need to to work within the uh, what's possible to to try to improve the lives of people who are affected. So thank you for the longer conversation on this topic. Also, absolutely, and we'll, we'll continue covering that issue. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thanks again, Thad. We appreciate you in a big way. Um, Jen, why don't you tell us what is going on on the Arts and Features Beat? Dave, I, I think the list of things that you can get at Walmart is long and overwhelming. I did not know that birds were on there. So, <laughs> um, yeah, really. Sarah, Sarah Hobart this week, who writes a lot about birding, not exclusively about birding, but a lot about birding, um, has a story entitled The Walmart Picnic Table Effect. And um, there's no picnic tables back there. I'm sorry. Don't go back <laughs> to make a picnic. There's no picnic tables. I was she, wondering. <laughs> she's calling it that based on something called the Patagonia Picnic Table Effect, which was an event that happened um, in, where is it, Oregon? Where, um, oh no, Oregon is where they did the study about it. Patagonia, I guess, is where it happened. Um, I'm not outdoorsy. Arizona. Arizona, thank you. Somewhere yeah. dry. So <laughs> anyway, this area, somebody saw a very rare bird, right? And then people 
flocked to see it. And then they saw more birds. And then the people who came to see those birds saw more birds. And that's called the Patagonia picnic table effect, which the University of Oregon dispels because they are zero fun. <laughs> the these are duck. rare birds, right? Sorry to interrupt you, but these are rare birds. These are rare birds. That's right. Um, rare, they're, rare the ducks, the they? they're the ducks. Why are they? Why are they so anti-bird? Anyway, um, <laughs> and yet it seems to be. You know, it broke a lot of birders' hearts because it felt very anecdotally true, and it kind of feels anecdotally true again over at Walmart, particularly for warblers. Warblers, I guess, don't come around to our area much, or these kinds of warblers don't come around unless they get lost. If they have navigational problems as young birds or, you know, grown women trying to find access humble on the CR campus sometimes do. Um, and they end up in our area. And then once it gets a little, you know, the temperature changes, they move on and they continue with their, um, their journey, their migration. And so some people saw some warblers. And then some people who came to see those warblers saw more warblers that are at least rare in our area. Among them, the Magnolia warbler, the Tennessee warbler, and I don't know, there's another warbler, but there's a, a grip, a grip of others. Yes, yes, a whole warble. Um, and in fact, Sarah sent me an update. She went to the spot behind Walmart again and uh, was just looking around and had a seven warbler day. Whoa. Yes, it's a wealth of warblers. <laughs> so, I mean, go check them out. And, you know, the other fun thing about the story is she mentions how, you know, there's all these people standing in a parking lot with binoculars and people who are just doing their shopping are like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you looking for? And, you know, the birders, as they do, shared what they were looking for and why it's rare, why it's interesting. And they may have converted some people to, to birding. Yes. Remember that they're always recruiting. I thought an interesting thing was that this is adjacent to the to the bay, and there's there were there's a variety of folks that frequent that space, and mm -hmm. and so so not just shoppers, other people like potentially security guards and police and others will call. Uh, we're just yeah. we're, that that's an area they frequent too. Yeah, and I think the security people were like, "What are you all doing here?" Yeah, and in fact, you know, they're probably going to make a warbler lover out of them. Well, this was actually really cool, um, and there's more in the article. And for folks, I think, who want to know more of the Autobahn folks, there's lots of birding groups in our community who would be more than happy to show you other places besides the picnic tables that don't exist behind Walmart. Yeah, and check out Sarah's cool pictures because they're just little fat yellow and gray birds. They're super cute. Very cool. Jen, why don't you tell us what else is going on the Arts and Features Beat this week in the little bit of time we've got left? Well, um, I am not done ruining Christmas. <laughs> so um, this week I have a seriously satire column titled The Elf on the Shelf is Begging You Not to Put Him Out This Year. <laughs> and the reason I, it's a monologue by The Elf on the Shelf literally being taken out of the box of Christmas stuff that, you know, after Thanksgiving, you start putting up a tree, whatever. And actually The Elf on the Shelf book specifies that you're supposed to do elf on the shelf stuff from Thanksgiving after Thanksgiving to Christmas. It, and I realized, Dave, you were not familiar with this tradition. That's because it's only been a tradition since 2005. Oh, that explains it. So Santa knows who's naughty or nice, right? He's keeping his list. He's checking yeah. it twice. Suddenly, in 2005, somebody writes a children's book in which now Santa is deploying elves to go and do boots on the ground or jingling boots on the ground um, reporting. And oh, the surveillance state. Now I get it. Surveillance state. Exactly. And I, the minute I saw people doing this thing where every night the elf goes and reports to Santa. And in the morning when kids wake up, they see the elf posed in some new way, usually doing some sort of hijinks. Um, I thought, my God, that poor elf. I just, just like when we talk about the surveillance state, I think to myself, oh, the poor person in the white van parked outside my house who has to listen to me complain on the phone to 10 different people telling the same story about how annoying that is. My God. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, no. Or even if it's AI technology, trust me, when the robots finally rise up and destroy humanity, it'll be because they just can't take it anymore. <laughs> um, but I thought this poor elf has to go through all of this. I, no, probably none of the other tchotchkes, the tree angel and the nutcracker and the little fat Santas over by the kitchen window, they probably hate him, right? Santa probably doesn't love this. Santa's <laughs> like been running this whole game for millennia. So, you know, since it was random people coming to your house in Sweden, but sure, all of a sudden, hire a bunch of elves without me. It seems it seems like a hostile takeover and I feel like Santa wouldn't like it. So it is my imagining if I were an elf, if I were a shelf elf, I would stop reporting. I would just be begging and maybe even turning to blackmail, depending on what I may have witnessed in this house. Well, thanks, Jen. We, Jen, we really appreciate it. We are just about out of time. I'm going to encourage folks to check it out. The story from the perspective of the elf who doesn't want to be called the snitch in the ditch. So thank you. But maybe not your kids. Right, right. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have this week. Dad and Jen, thank you so much. As always, this was really fun this week. Thanks, thanks Dave. Jeff. North Coast Journal is available on newsstands now. Pick one up, stay informed. Uh, also available online 24 7, so you can check them out anytime. Again, thanks, Dad and Jen, for joining us. Thank you out there for listening and take care until we connect again next week. Bye, guys. Bye.